Well, hello and welcome back to the Dan John University podcast. As we begin this today, I feel kind of lucky. I just finished an international trip and I was, my wife and I both agree we were like a day early coming home. Uh, we didn't have long lines coming in through immigration. Of course, um, we all sir, we all do all those go, go global and all those other things, the TSA pre and of course, and we're also both diamond members. And so we were pretty lucky and, and I'm, and that brings me to an important point. I'd like to talk about the pandemic that's going on right now. Uh, there's, there's a couple issues I'd like to go over if you don't mind. First, I got to give you my life philosophy. I, I just feel like I have to, I have to start there. Um, my friend Jim Marcosian says the problem with asking me a question is I always have to start with in the beginning and then circle around each and every variable and then finally come to my point. But in this case, it's really important to me. We here in this home, there's basically three foundational beliefs we have. And I worry that, especially in the United States today, a few of them are being lost. Number one is we believe in the absolute dignity of each and every human person. So if a person who comes in from another another country comes into your place and you kick them out because they're Chinese or Korean, that doesn't reflect the absolute dignity of each and every human person. Um, during times of disease and trouble, it's always easy to blame people, uh, the others, the thems. And the truth is, folks, when you get, if you keep going down that spiral, pretty soon everybody's a them. And that goes against everything I believe in. The second thing, thing I strongly believe in, it's called the preferential option for the poor. So whenever you make a decision, you got to think about how does it infect, how does it infect, how does it affect the poor? How does it affect the deaf, the blind, uh, those who need a little extra lift up for just normal? Well, what's happening in the States right now is that they want to close all these schools and then they want to go to online education. My wife, Tiffany, and I came uh, uh, basically paid for an entire program a few years ago called Cow. And it's called Computer on Wheels. There was a school here locally in which the bulk of the third graders had no computer at home and had never used a computer. So we, we did the Cow program. We bought them classroom sets of computers so that the kids could learn how to use computers. Well, God bless them. I hope it makes a difference. And I hope it makes a difference in one of those kids' lives. And that's, that'll be great. But here's the thing. Those same children go home and are expected to do online education without computers. Many of those same kids get their breakfast and lunch at school. So when you close school, there's a gap. And that gap is breakfast, lunch, online education. Um, we need to always keep that in mind. And the third thing, of course, in this family, and it's our family, it's our family mission statement, it's make a difference. And as small as this little podcast might be, I feel, and thanks again to Brian, I feel that this podcast makes a difference. The emails we're getting daily are, they're pretty, I'd be mean, honestly, they're inspiring. And this is also a good time that you can make a difference. Now, there's all kinds of things you can do. One, for most Americans anyway, stop hoarding toilet paper. If you run out of toilet paper, folks, and the water's working, you have another option. You can take a shower. And if the shower doesn't make you clean enough, then we have to have another set of discussions later on. Um, make a difference. Um, you might have a neighbor who, uh, our, our good friend across the street, she's struggling uh, with really virulent cancer right now. So if you're wandering around, going to the bars every night and then dropping by and visiting her, God bless you for visiting her, but you might be spreading disease uh, that might take her uh, out. Now, at the same time, the, at the same time, you know, I don't know how to say this, but I was fortunate in a way. And this is going to sound strange. My mom, who, who died August, uh, uh, pardon me, October 2nd, 1980, um, as late as August of that year, she was still fairly active. Um, in the month of September was, was rough. And then she died very quickly, a very condensed uh, window of morbidity. 
My father, uh, we're not sure exactly what happened, but on Halloween of 1991, uh, he was found uh, uh, dead in front of the uh, in front of the TV set. So I have seen, um, I, I I have been lucky in my life to see condensed uh, periods of morbidity with with my family members. At the same time, I've also seen those long, uh, difficult uh, deaths that my friends' parents have had to endure. Um, death is as part of life, um, and I know in my own case that. Uh, I am closer to the end of my days than I am to the beginning of my days. But I also would, would not want to be the person that gets the finger pointed at me to bringing something preventable like the coronavirus into somebody else's home or to be part of the system that allows someone to die too soon. So I, I, hope, I hope each of you um, takes the idea of pandemic seriously and as if you know me you know that i think of everything as a check mark um, um it, it comes from nasm talibus the hockey stick but it's the idea that you know there is this whole area of things in life that if you just do a little bit often over the long haul good things are going to happen for you so i would argue that for most of the people listening to this podcast you've probably been doing those things getting enough sleep every night uh getting some sunshine uh, eating vegetables, uh, don't let yourself get uh, uh, morbidly obese, uh, keeping an eye on the basics of life, doing all those tiny little things, flossing your teeth, wearing your seatbelt, all those things that really over time add up to a lot more than walking around with the face mask on all day long. But at the other hand, there are those things like the Spanish flu of 1918, in 1918, one of our American cities decided not to cancel a parade. And because of that huge group of people gathered, the Spanish flu wiped out a huge population of that city. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this. It is going to be the little things that the best things you can do. But at the same time, let's all try not to make it much, much worse. Thank you very much for listening. You know, I want to add one last thing. Um, some of you who have decided not to go to gyms or you want to stay inside during this time, uh, I feel bad about selling things because someone kind of attacked us online for the fact that sometimes I'll say in our Q&A here that, you know, at Dan John University, use the workout generator. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's a good piece of equipment. But if you are deciding to stay home, go to the generator, uh, pick 30 to one hour uh, workouts, if you don't have equipment at home, you'll still get a, a workout for you. If you have marginal amounts of equipment, you'll still get workouts that you can do at home. Um, and I, I guess, I guess if there's going to be an upside from this pandemic, one little upside is going to be the fact that some of you will appreciate the importance of having a minimal home gym. Um, a single kettlebell and a single suspension trainer for me was a game tra changer for a lot of my career as I was dealing with multiple travel and home issues all at once. Being able to get those little workouts in was a life changer for me. So during this time of the pandemic, I still want you to drink water, eat veggies, eat protein. If you're home all the time, practice, you know, lower your stress levels. Uh, get a workout or get a workout in and every day between 30 minutes and an hour using your own facilities at home and maybe come out on the other end of this better and brighter than ever. Okay. And good luck to you. We have a question from Jay here. Jay, he asks, I wanted to get your thoughts on the optimal number of hours to fast each day. So just, to, just for uh, clarity, folks, he asked optimal hours of fast each day. Now, we all know there's multiple, multiple fasting methods. Um, you know, I've, I've heard of people online having success with fasting windows of four to seven days. Um, uh, we know that, the, uh, 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 that some of the uh, Irish uh, uh, fasted for longer than that during the, during the, during the troubles, um, on those, on those starvations. 
Um, we also know that a lot of people have success with two 24-hour fasts in a week, and that system is usually called the 5-2. Five, five days of eating, two days of fasting. But the way Jay asked the question, I want to make sure I answer this question. If you're doing intermittent fasting or daily fasting, uh, how, how long do you think? And then he has a follow-up question, which softens the whole question automatically. Do you think the number of hours fasted really matters as long as at least 10 hours or so? Well, generally, unless you're in a <clears throat> mass building program, I don't think I would ever want you to fast less than eight or nine hours a day. And I call that eight or nine hour a day fast. I call that sleeping. Um, I think it makes good sense not to, you know, eat while you're asleep. For, for logistic risk reasons and safety reasons. Uh, I, I also know from the heart, it's probably a good idea not to eat within two hours of going to bed. And that's just something I've noticed in my life. Uh, and that's feedback from others. Um, you probably want to swing that to maybe, if you go to bed at, let's just say 10, eating after six, I mean, I can understand why, but generally for most of us in who focus on health, fitness, longevity, performance, we after dinner eating is usually frowned upon. So automatically right there, Jay, you're looking at about a eight to 12 hour fast every day without even doing intermittent fasting. If you eat breakfast, uh, you went to bed at 10, you get up at six, eat breakfast, you're looking at a, you're looking at an eight to 10 hour fast almost by default. Um, many of us who have tried intermittent fasting, like in my case, I started getting into it because of, uh, I started training in the morning. Uh, I started training at 6 a.m. because of career and other stuff. And pretty soon I noticed that if I held on, if I fasted, worked out, and held that fast for a few more hours, I was able to get a lot more, you know, work work done. Um, Men's Health came out with a book a few years ago, which upset some people because they said they invented fasting, where they argued a 16-hour fast every day. Um... So I think you're probably right. I would say at least more than 10 hours. And, and the only reason I would say that, Jay, is that for the bulk of people in health and fitness, they do a 10-hour fast by default daily all the time. Do I get more benefits as I push my fast longer and longer every day? Uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I fast sneaking up on 18 plus hours a day simply because my my training sessions at 11 a.m. and I'm holding on to my fast through it. The workout takes an hour, hour and change, get home, uh, make my meal. Are those days better than the normal days where I fast probably, you know, uh, 13, 14 hours? I don't know. So that's one of the kind of the lost things, Jay. I can't really answer specifically, but I think you're on the right you're on the right track there. I get more work done fasting, but that's a trick I use with myself. Uh, if I put off eating, which is kind of a reward, until my workout and my work are finished, I tend to really push myself to get my workout and my work done. Now, are there magical benefits of fasting? I actually think so, but at the same time. You can see that just your, I, I'm doing this as a lifestyle, a lifestyle hack, so to speak. One other thing a lot of people are, did about 20 years ago was eating a, a good breakfast um, and then fasting until uh, uh, dinner so that you have two fasts in a day. Now, small joke I always mention is that if you're not shoveling food in your mouth, you're fasting. So my joke used to be I would fast between the entree and dessert. You know, that's my fasting window, you know. Um, it, it's a good question, Jay. I, just to answer your second part, 10 hours is almost what you're going to do naturally. And I would strongly suggest that for anybody daily who wants to have any measure of uh, fitness, health, uh, longevity. Thank you. We have a question from Jochen, uh, a very popular name in the, uh, the German area. Can you say a few words on pros and cons of the floor press versus the bench press? I honestly can't, Jochen. Um, uh, I, I've tried. My friend Steve Shaffley is uh, told me about the floor press. He's a big fan. 
I know that a lot of people like it. Um, no, I am never a big fan of anything that would stop your elbows from going back, only because as a person of broken wrists, that uh, that floor press press position is literally how I broke my wrist uh, in a part. Of course, a, a snatch bar was flying into it, but um, so I really can't uh, talk about an exercise I don't do, I've never done, and I've never had any of my people do. Um, uh, you can see though by having by giving me an either or question, which is kind of what you did. It's always going to be difficult for me not to make you do the next level. Uh, I think both of those uh, don't compare to the overhead press, the military press, um, even uh, the incline press, which was my uh, maybe my first love affair as, as a young as a young lifter. Uh, I still think the overhead work is going to be superior. Sorry, I can't really answer that very well. You know, you know, I got to tell you this question from Amanda. I really like because it actually, I don't know how to say this nicely. It kind of upset me, it, it, but you'll see why as I go through the question. Ready? You reminded us all to eat our vegetables. Yes, yes, I did, folks. I mean, wow, what a what a reach that is. Hey, eat your vegetables, eat protein, drink water. Mind blowing. I've been getting in more veggies at work via soups. And yes, I buy the cans with the easy pull tops. It, I do too because it's much easier and it takes a lot less self-discipline to open that can. And as I was eating one of my soups, I commented to my boss, getting my veggies, to which he responded, oh, I don't think that's what J Dan John meant. He went on to say that the soups are high in sodium and that he took your veggie recommendation as raw vegetables and salads. I, I don't know why uh, that he would have done that. Now, I'm not ripping on your boss at all. Your boss seems like, hey, well read, he reads me. But really, <laughs> when I work with a typical American, you know, in the last week, somebody reported they had never seen the President of the United States eat a vegetable. I want you to think about that. Oh, by the way, another person reports they've never seen him read a book, but we don't want to comment on a person who doesn't read books or eat vegetables. But never eating a vegetable? So here's the issue I run into all the time, Amanda, is most Americans, well, we are slided into most Americans are obese right now, right? We're, we're on our way to it. If it hasn't already happened, we're there. And someone like myself says, eat vegetables. And then now we start with that question that comes up at workshops all the time. I will say, folks, eat vegetables, eat protein, drink water. And it's true, Amanda, hands come up and this is what happens. What do you mean by a vegetable? And I hate that question. Because all that is, is a pushback question. That's when I write online that you should sleep eight or nine hours a night, I will get a comment from somebody. I have, you know, I have two kids. How am I supposed to get eight or nine hours of sleep a night? Here, I'll tell you how. Turn the TV off. Don't let your kids watch TV. Get those screens, you know, don't let them do this all night long. If your kids are sleeping, you can sleep. So this, I'm not saying it bothers me, but what this did is reminded me of growing up. When I was young, it, it, I do love my family. I absolutely love my family. But my family had this ability to pee on any goal you had. To the point that I finally learned, I was probably in the ninth grade, to stop talking about my goals. Except with my sister Corinne. Which is why when I tell the story about how in the ninth grade I decided to go to Utah State University and throw the discus for Ralph Mon, the only person I told was my sister Corinne. And I don't know if she's ever told anybody else. But... One of the things I wanted to do as a kid, uh, when I, I worked as, a, as a, a bouncer in a bar, is I wanted, and Greg Winslow and I were going to do this, we wanted to open a beer bar that only had like three or five different taps at three or five different locations. And we, here was the idea, is that everything was done with self-serve, you know, with cards. It was a great idea. And I went and talked about it, and my family said, well, you'll, It'll be long hours. You, you'll stay up all night. And all they did was find 
problems with my idea about opening my own bar. Uh, when I want to do different goals, the thing that would always come up was problems. It would pee on everything I did. My brother, who died last June, when I finally got my first starting position in American football, I came home and I was so proud. And he said, well, everybody ends up starting in football. And I remember feeling, thinking, what was I thinking of saying something positive? So let's do this. Your boss is right. I recommend raw vegetables, um, 300 pounds of raw vegetables a day, uh, or 400 pounds, uh, if you can get that in. Um, <laughs> you're also right. I love the convenience of those darn pop-top canned vegetable soups where you go like this. I sneak in, honestly, probably one or two of those a day. It is sometimes when I'm just like, I got to get something in, it's so much better than potato chips, he says, until he catches himself. And he reminds himself that if there's potato chips while I'm cooking the vegetable soup, I'll probably be knocking it out of chips. So now back to her question. To which I responded that I have no blood pressure issues and thus am not concerned about sodium intake. Oh, by the way, here's how to get around that, Amanda. I buy the low sodium veggie soup. Uh, I also buy the low sodium V8. And on Sunday mornings, if you take a low sodium V8 and you add vodka to it, you have a healthy morning drink. I also commented that I know you have referenced in your books and podcasts that you make stews to get your vegetables. So my question, or what I would appreciate hearing you riff on, well, you got your riff, uh, is what do you mean when you say eat more vegetables? In what ways are you getting your eight different vegetables a day? Um, Brian will tell you, anybody who's ever come train with me will tell you. When I go to breakfast over at Landmark after our workouts, I order the veggie omelet. Uh, if there's a, if they have a, two days a week, they have a veggie beef soup. And I almost most of the time with, oh, and then I have, it's called Leo. Leo was one of the great weight staff over at Landmark. I have everything, we call it Leo carbine, where you add on to everything, your, whatever else you have, they pour on all the vegetables they have at the place. I also, anytime I make any kind of soup or stew, I'll just pour the bag in. One other good thing to do, uh, and, and Amanda, this isn't a bad idea, Try to go to an all-inclusive place sometime. And as you serve yourself, um, I've noticed this in Okinawa, Hawaii, Jamaica, and a few other places, that if you eat the cultural foods of the area, almost always the food is heavy in beans, light amounts of rice, and tons of vegetables. Costa Rica's breakfast is basically that. With, with eggs in it. And so for me, one of the things I'd like you to think about is the historical cuisines of most places. Uh, you know, if you will, eat more native. And when you when you come back from these different places, and I ask the wait staff and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the chefs all the time about this, they'll always have these little regional foods that are just loaded with vegetables and extremely inexpensive. I believe in Jamaica, it's called Kalalu, and it's, we would probably call it like a kale or spinach, but there's also a varietal of peppers in it and onions, and it's just a breakfast side salad, a, a breakfast side dish, a side salad, and it's very simple. So those are the ways I do it. And thank you for a great question, and you and your boss need to sit down and hash out this argument about whether or not soup in a can is a vegetable or not. We got a question from Chris, and in this question from Chris, um, I, I had to go on to my NFL Sunday thing, and in the question, my first thought was, come on, man. So here we go, from Chris. I was reading through some older articles, and you mentioned that if we add in the push-up in the HKC3, swing, gobble squat, Turkish getup, it would provide a good program for health and longevity. So... What does the push-up do that the Turkish get-up, swing, and goblet squat cannot do? And my notes to myself right here are, come on, man. <laughs> so, the push-up, it's, it's a push. And if you do a lot of them, you're, you'll have 
doorway, door wide shoulders and titanic triceps and purgatorial pectorals. It's a pushing exercise. The downside of the, the HKC3 is there's no real true push. Um, that's why when I teach the HKC, I always teach people the half kneeling press and the press as just a sprinkle on. And I go in great depth into the push up too. It's a push. There is no push technically in the HKC3. Secondly, can I indeed fulfill all my bases of strength with body weight and kettlebells? Yeah, uh, if, I mean, not if you want to be a world-class power lifter. That would be stuff you do in the off-season or in general training, yeah. Uh, yes, but not if you want to be a world-class Olympic lifter. You'd have to snatch and clean a jerk, I think. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it would depend on what you think your, your bases are. Uh, here's one thing. I mean, if you get yourself up to, well, I mean, if you do the 10,000 swing challenge with, with a big kettlebell, and you can not, and you're knocking off push-ups and pull-ups between each round, uh, and and goblet squats. You know, if you do the, follow the original program, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have a nice strong engine. In fact, if you get into a deadlift contest and you haven't dead, you'll be you'll be a solid engine. Specifically, can a push-up Turkish get-up combo, appropriate progression or number of reps, fulfill your minimum of pressing strength? Can goblet squats and sings, swings of some kind fulfill your minimums of pulling weight off the floor? So I would say without a doubt, there, there, there's no question in my mind. Um, but again, you, you always have to make sure it, it's two things. Uh, uh, it's, and I think it's great. Yeah. There's two things, Chris, as a strength coach, I'm always trying to get you to think about. Number one is gaps. What are the gaps in your training program? And for me, basically, I usually see three gaps. The person doesn't, the, the pr training program has no loaded carry. So there's no farmer walks, prowlers, sled pulls. We can throw hill sprints and stadium steps in there if you'd like. Um, no bear crawl, uh, bear hug carries. There's no loaded carries. Remember, Milo or Milo, he didn't, remember, as I said last time, he didn't pick up the bull and tricep press it. He carried it. The second big gap I usually see in training programs is a lack of authentic squatting and sometimes no squats at all. And you don't necessarily have to go super heavy on squats, but you should have the movement with load. And then the third area is no groundwork. Uh, and that's what we call this, what's part of the sixth move in, our, in my, my family of teaching this. Um, never in the training program, they see the person getting up and down off the ground. Uh, there's no tumbling, there's no groundwork. It's like the crown is like, you know, you don't touch it. Um, the nice thing about what I'm seeing here uh, from, from your idea, you, you've, you're covering those uh, fairly well here. Uh, one quick thing, uh, sometimes I include the Turkish getup uh, both as groundwork and as a loaded carry. Uh, it's just, the more time you spend looking at something, sometimes you're more like, huh, uh, that's interesting. So yes. But the second thing is this, so gaps first, and then number two is standards. Um, as a discus thrower, you know, you need to clean 300 pounds. You need to squat 450. You need to bench 400. Those are the minimums. So um, uh, I read a lot of work from the European uh, track and field community. Their standards, and I'll change them from, I'm changing these from kilos to pounds for clarity. But it's a 200-pound snatch, 300-pound clean. 400 pound squat and it doesn't matter what event you're doing from pole vaulter to thrower you've got to be that that's your base that's your standard but if you're not an elite thrower you don't need those standards so you just need to figure out <clears throat> what would be a good standard for you thank you chris we have a question from rob what are your thoughts on sumo deadlifting for general strength and or sports performance. Now, you just separated the two things. Um, sports performance, there's only one sport that would come up in, and that is powerlifting. Uh, if you're built to sumo, you sumo. Uh, if you're built, if you're born to do conventional, you do conventional. Um, it would be a, uh, this sounds crazy, it would be a knock I have on powerlifting because it's just a small thing. But the in deadlifting, the bar is the exact same space on the floor for every body type from 
the lightest, shortest competitors to the biggest competitor in the thing. It's not a knock, but it is, it's the sport. So in the sport of powerlifting, if sumo helps you, sumo helps you, okay? And, and if it doesn't, you, it, you, it doesn't. Now, for general strength, uh, I, I don't usually recommend uh, the, the from the floor deadlift for general strength training. Uh, almost universally now, I have people move the weight up a little bit um, to be in a more appropriate position for the hinge. Uh, if you're built to be able to hinge from the floor, uh, good for you, but probably anyone past 5'9", five, 5'10", five, in height has to move to the to the rack deadlift family. Um, so for me, general strength, um, I, I, I don't see it. So make sure you separate that out in your mind, Rob. If you're competing, it's an option for you as an athlete. If you're not competing, you would have to weigh that in to how it fits with what you want. Okay? We got a question from Dave, and actually it's a really easy question for me to answer, uh, Dave. What are your thoughts on bigger, faster, stronger program for high school football players? You might not know this, Dave, but I worked for that corporation for a couple of years. If you, can go, if you can find the old videos, which are kind of fun, like the power clean, it's variations. It's like a one hour video. That's me. I'm doing the power clean video. Um, I'll be at workshops sometimes. And it's weird to think of how long I've been in the business because a, a balding coach with 30 plus years experience in the weight room will come and say, I watched your videos when I was first coming up. And I'll be like, oh my God, I feel old. Um, in one of the videos, uh, Greg, Greg Shepard says something that's not right. And I wanted to correct him, but it was his video. So I had to do, uh, I had to power clean 315 pounds 10 straight times for video. And he kept telling me that my finish was incorrect because I was finishing here. And he taught that you were supposed to look at the ceiling as you finished. Well, it's, well, I mean, might be possible with 135 pounds, but with that load, it's not possible. And I didn't feel like it was my place to correct him. And I look back in hindsight and I realize I should have corrected him then because people are listening to him make that uh, not solid uh, coaching point. For those you who don't know, Bigger, Faster, Stronger is a combination of just about everything in one program. Uh, there's nutritional things, there's warm-up, there's agility stuff. The tr uh, strength program is based on combining uh, power lifts and Olympic lifts. Um, they really pushed the trap bar before anybody else even knew about it. Uh, they only Olympic lift one day a week. It has box squats. It's towel bench press or bounce bench press. Now, I don't know what to call it now. Um, the system is pretty simple. You'd start off week one is three, three sets of three. Week two is uh, five sets of five. Week three is a bit of a, a heavy, heavy week. I think it's five, three as many. And then week four was always the problem. And I feel like my work cleaned it up quite a bit. We, we changed the numbers around. Uh, basically, it was a deload week that made sense to no one at all. Uh, week four, you're supposed to break your personal records. Um, is it a good program for high school football? Yeah. Now, in their marketing, they'll argue that, you know, you break 37 personal records a week. Well, one of the things, and it's not a bad idea for a high school program, is that every August when you start up on the program again, you threw out all your old records so <clears throat> even though you've been lifting the program for three years, on your fourth year, when you squat 135 for three, you broke a new personal record. And so uh, is it a good program? Yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, it, it, it certainly needs tweaks. Uh, it needs good coaching. It needs um, a lot of record keeping. I mean, so there are issues with it. Uh, for those who've never coached high school football, record keeping uh you're not looking at one or two athletes you're looking at 60 to 90 athletes you're keeping the records for so that can add up and you practically need a full time and i was very lucky because i just had uh tas to do this for me but uh, uh student assistants um to keep track of so if you do break a record here and it's worthy of going up on the board that transition uh, I spent a lot of time typing with this little machine to put the new records up. 
So that would be, to me, that would be the most difficult thing. But here's the thing. It's the most difficult, but it's also the most important. So yes, I think it's a very good program. And uh, is it perfect? No. Uh, we were actually more successful in our system with uh, Jim Wendler's 531. But if you listen to what I just explained with Bigger, Faster, Stronger, BFS, BFS and 531 are actually in very close. The reason it was easier for me was because I had those dedicated tumbling days once every two weeks. And also to uh, a system we call the warm-up is the workout. That's where we did all of our kettlebell work. So for the first 45 minutes of our weight group, uh, our weight session, we were doing kettlebells, calisthenics, uh, mobility work, uh, just a variety of things. And then we got into the training session itself. Um, uh, Wendler's 531 worked better for us. And this is going to sound silly in a way, but because we only had to keep track of four basic numbers um, the bench press the squat variation uh, the deadlift deadlift variation and the overhead press uh, that's sometimes just the amount of record keeping got in the way I would incorporate the Olympic lifts into other times of the year I would incorporate mass made simple into other times of the year I would incorporate sprint work and outdoor work other times of the year so uh, thank you for that question Dave I appreciate that well, this is nice, um, and I really appreciate this. We're getting feedback from the questions. And I, I, and I love the fact that you said feedback because we're supposed to be a loop here. I really appreciate this. Feedback to Nigel's fasting window question. From Mark, I wanted to comment about my experience with fasting and training in circumstances similar to Nigel's. My fasting window is generally from... Uh, 1900 to 1100 okay okay so about we're, we're fine so the evening so i do park bench workouts five to six days per week good for you and i add some additional loaded carries and rucking as well good so do i during the week i train at 5 a.m so i have at least five and sometimes six hours post workout that i am still fasting at 36 my body comp is better than ever and my energy levels are really good up until I eat my first meal. I do feel that my mental focus at work, law enforcement, executive gig, is best during those fasting hours as well. That's that Yarek we always talk about. Overall, I've been very pleased with my progress. Well, Mark, thanks so much. Uh, actually, since discussing this, I, I kind of deep dived into this. And one of the things I discovered was in the early years of the evolutionary fitness model, uh, Art Devaney, Rob Wolf, before it all splintered into, you know, paleo pancakes, uh, uh, combining, uh, <laughs> there, I read a paleo meal where you, you have salmon with coconut oil. Well, the chances of any person from the paleolithic period getting both a salmon and coconut would be less than you think, um, you know, but, we'll, we'll, you know, elk burgers at mcdonald's uh it's got the same smell to me but i one of the things that they were very big about was eating breakfast and then having the big fasting window between breakfast and dinner with a workout in between um so you're getting your fast post dinner fast and then a post workout fast in once a day so yeah many there's many routes uh, up this mountain and I really appreciate your feedback, Mark. Let's do one more from Nigel himself. Following on your question about how I feel between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m., uh, real quick, folks, for his reference, uh, because of my uh, Nigel's life, he fasts, uh, he fasts all night long, wakes up in the morning, gets a workout in, and then continues to fast until noon. So he has a so he kind of nails it in a way. He, he Here's your one-stop shop for both kinds of fasting. Your post-dinner fast, the workout, and then your post-workout compounded with your post-dinner fast. Um, my personal trainer does this also. I feel great, and I'm not sure I get the Yarek focus you talked about. Yarek, again, is that, that's that vision a hawk has when it's hungry. Um, <laughs> 
but I'm a middle school technology teacher, so that intensity may scare the children. I found it very valuable as a teacher to have a lot of intensity. Yeah, but although I do love the word and I try to use it often, good, there's nothing wrong with, you know, keeping those the words around, expanding our vocabularies. I was speaking with my brother-in-law who is in his mid-20s and coincidentally, he happened to be doing an identical fast and workout time protocol as me. Before I had mentioned your comments on being hyper-focused, he mentioned that during that period, that time period, he felt super focused and that meetings were also going great. Well, I'm telling you, Nigel, maybe here's your book, okay? The Nigel Twin Focus Fast. Write that down. That's a moneymaker. But yeah, I, I think you guys might be onto something. Just just for the record, though, a couple things, Nigel. I'm not I'm not completely sure that everybody has the discipline to do what you're doing. Um, to get up in the morning, get that workout in first thing, you know, drink a glass of water, shower up, shave, get to work, work, and then eat. However, I also think that'd be miles easier than what a lot of people think it would be like. I think hearing it, hearing your, your Nigel's, and I already forgot my million dollar idea name, hearing the Nigel Fast Focus Protocol, that's a good one too, um, hearing it sounds like it's to be this much commitment, but I bet in the actual doing of it, it's pretty easy. Uh, that's the thing I've picked up. I find it much easier if I'm not eating to not eat. Uh, <laughs> once I start walking, I find it easier to walk. Uh, once I start sleeping, I find it easier to sleep. Uh, I think I think you're on to something here. I think this might be a nice little answer to the riddle of how do we put together life, uh, real life, and these fasting ideas. You, I don't know how much earlier you're getting up to get your workout in, but on the site, and I and I hate to always. Uh, if somebody got on us uh, on the YouTube about the fact, or on Facebook, that I actually tell people <laughs> to look at my materials, I, I don't know. I don't know what I did wrong in recommending going to the website. But if you go to the Park Bench Workout Generator, you know you could plug in thirty-minute workouts with almost minimal amount of equipment. Um, you know, if all you had was an ab wheel. Uh, well, you, you, you don't even need anything. You don't need any equipment at all, and the generator will give you workouts. But at home, if you had something as simple as a dumbbell, a kettlebell, an ab wheel, if uh, I've our, I trained for quite a while with just one 28 kilo kettlebell and a, and a, and a suspension trainer, and I actually made pretty good cr progress uh, post total hip replacement the first time, just with those two pieces of equipment. So, yeah, it. If you uh, did a half an hour park bench workout every morning upon arisal, you would warm up, uh, you know, you get your warm up, you get mobility work, you get the, the basic human movements in and, you know, go, go on and do the good work for a few hours. Have a, you know, break the, break the fast, not with a breakfast, but a lunch fist and enjoy the day. I, I love, I love your idea. I continue to want to hear uh, about this, Nigel. I think you are making a difference. Thank you.